Hello, this is Aaron and welcome back to the show. I'm very excited today to be joined by special guest, Julius Krein. Julius is the founder and editor of American Affairs Journal, which is a great policy journal you can find online at AmericanAffairsJournal.org. I was going to say that it was a great conservative policy journal, but I think that that doesn't fully do it justice. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that uh, during the conversation. So Julius, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me and thank you for the kind words about American Affairs. You uh, neglected to mention that you have written for yeah. it uh, three times, I think. Yes. Yeah, so I've, I've gotten three pieces in there, and uh, it's, it's been an honor. And I'm, I'm, I always like to try to, if I'm going to be in the, in the pages, or I want to make sure it's something good. So <laughs> I, I work hard. Uh, I work hard to try to produce good content for you. Well, what is, maybe you could give a, just a short description of what American Affairs Journal actually is. Sure. Uh, so in the simplest terms, it's a quarterly policy journal um, in print and online, of course, uh, with long form essays. Um, mainly focused, I would say, on issues of political economy and, and policy, economic policy. Um, but of course, we cover other topics as well, from, from foreign policy to more theoretical uh, affairs. And we also uh, host events from time to time and do some other kind of more think tank stuff. But certainly, the Quarterly Journal is our flagship product. Yeah, and it really is great. And what I like is there really are, when you say long form, you're not joking. I mean, people could have um, the kinds of articles you might read in, say, a London Review of Books kind of length and really well thought out. And so many of these I just find very informative. Uh, so I, I look forward to each issue coming out. And it really is mostly the quarterly journals. You're not doing like 10 web pieces a day or something. So it's you can read just the good stuff and not get overwhelmed with too much uh, too much filler. Well, we, we hope so. Um, yeah. But yeah, we definitely we only really do long, long form pieces. And, you know, a number of them are fairly detailed um, in the weeds policy pieces that, you know, frankly, are never going to attract a large audience. Um, but for that reason, uh, the issues are often not covered elsewhere and um, are perhaps even more necessary to sort of influence policy in the way that we would like. Um, I've been told it's a very demanding uh, publication, which I take as a compliment. And right. I think uh, uh, there was an article recently about J.D. Vance, actually, that mentioned it and called it uh, comically dense, um, mm. which, which I actually appreciate. So, uh, you know, everyone should know what they're getting into. But uh, we definitely look at these issues or, or attempt to look at these issues seriously and uh, come up with serious solutions to uh, the problems. Now, I'd mentioned I was going to call it a conservative policy journal because you came from political conservatism somehow. So I know that you worked in the finance industry, uh, but how did you get involved with sort of policy and, I guess, conservatism? I assume you were involved with conservatism in some way before coming to the journal. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say my politics, I've always been interested in politics and I, my politics, personal politics have always been somewhat idiosyncratic. But insofar as I had a relationship with conservatism, it probably began in college um, at Harvard, where I studied under Harvey Mansfield and therefore just ended up meeting a lot of people uh, in the conservative orbit. Um, some of them, you know, I'd be somewhat ashamed to affiliate with now. But uh, nevertheless, uh, as a result of that, my sort of background in terms of relationships in politics was was always more on the right, uh, mm -hmm. though I perhaps never really fit in with the right um, intellectually or, or substantively entirely on policy. But that that's not to say I uh, have ever identified as being on the left either. Um, mm -hmm. There was there was a good joke. I it might have been Wilmore Kendall or somebody who said something like, you know, just because I'm not uh, dumb enough to be a liberal doesn't mean I'm stupid enough to be a conservative or something like right. that. There uh, you go. Yeah, well, that's good. Now, immediately, I guess, before you started the journal, you were involved with something called the Journal of American Greatness, I think it was called. What was that and how did you get connected with the writers there? Uh, that ha that was almost totally by accident. Um, but basically what happened, uh, because I'd always been on the periphery of, of politics and I was still working full time in finance at that point, but uh, this was fall 2015. And Donald Trump was was leading in the primaries. And I ended up uh, 
watching an event of his on C-SPAN. Uh, and I thought, wow, this guy's going to win the Republican primary. And initially we, you know, my friends and I had kind of, and, and most of them were also in finance. They were not sort of political operative types. Um, we all kind of felt the same thing. And initially we published some pieces um, in existing publications, uh, basically saying as much. And then as time went on, Trump kept, kept leading pretty much every conservative publication sort of issued a fatwa against any article that could even be remotely construed as, as pro-Trump. Uh, and this group of friends and I sort of decided, well, we'll start our own little anonymous blog and maybe a couple hundred people will read it and we'll have fun. And it ended up becoming surprisingly popular, almost too popular at the time. We all thought mm. we'd lose our jobs. Um, but it did suggest that there was an interest in this stuff and led us to want to, uh, to write uh, you know, more seriously under our own names. And, and also, interestingly, that blog, the pieces that got the most views were not the typical hit and run political blog pieces, but the longer form stuff, even more esoteric stuff, uh, which suggested that maybe there was more of an opening in the long form space. Well, the piece that first got my attention was one that was, I don't think it was actually originally published there. It was the Flight 93 election, uh, which was written, you know, by someone who went by the name Publius, like Decius, Musk, yep, yep. which was um, uh, actually Michael Anton, I guess. Uh, but it was originally, I think it was originally published in the Claremont Review of Books or simultaneously published. I'm not sure which. Well, it's it gets somewhat complicated yeah. because after we shut down the Journal of American Greatness, another site popped up, which is still around, uh, called American Greatness. Uh, and, and I believe it was, uh, that piece was published at Claremont and American Greatness simultaneously. And obviously, mm -hmm. uh, what uh, was highly popular and, and very influential. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, what I remember, and by, I remember that I was working at the Manhattan Institute at the time, and we used to have these uh, quarterly city journal lunches where we would sit around and talk about issues and, you know, think about what we might want to write articles about for the future. And I remember telling these people, like, y Donald Trump is, like, legit. This is – you may not like Donald Trump, but this guy – this candidacy is not a joke. This guy is way more on fire than you think he is. I, I saw Trump coming back in 2015. Nobody believed me. And uh, it really it really did sort of uh, – event sort of overtook people, I think, by surprise in the conservative movement – and definitely, you know, from the whole National Review, never Trump issue, um, you know, to so many more things, definitely, you know, they did not like Trump. Um, and, you know, I think, it, you know, at, at City Journal, I think we always tried to be fair uh, about it, including say, well, what are the good things about Trump? What are the bad things about Trump? And that caused so many problems. Uh, because uh, we we got accused of being insufficiently anti-Trump, and one of our uh, one of our long-term fe uh, time fellows quit Saul Stern, and then went to like the New York Times, and this is all public. I mean, he just started attacking us as as crazy. When you would not you would definitely not consider City Journal a pro-Trump journal, I think by any means. Uh, so that goes to show you like how the how high the tensions were. I think around Trump during that campaign. Um, but one of the things that came out, and I think that uh, uh, Journal of American Greatness kind of really captured was that Trump had put his fingers on some issues in the conservative world that needed to be rethought. And in my view, the triumvirate of Trump issues were immigration, trade, and wars. And there was kind of a need to rethink some of this uh, dogma which, as it originally developed, may have been more sophisticated and really relevant to the particular challenges of an era like, say, the 1980s, but had kind of devolved into formulas and were not really reflective of a lot of the real world. And so what do you think the big issues are uh, that need to be rethought in political conservatism today now that you've had the journal, you know, American Affairs going, exploring these issues for a few years. Yeah, well, first, I mean, it's just thinking back to Trump 2016, um, it, it's fascinating, you know, how much of an upheaval that was. And, you know, uh, 
Trump 2016, or, you know, the Trump White House and re-election campaign became very different uh, than 2016 and the whole political environment changed as well. But I, I think, you know, I would put it in terms of Trump actually attacked the big failures of the bipartisan consensus since the end of the Cold War, since the 90s, the, the Bush-Clinton consensus, which was, was of course, you know, the, the foreign policy failures uh, in the Middle East, um, the the failure of free trade to actually deliver on the promises that were made to justify it. Um, and uh, you, you could add the, essentially, but, you know, pre-Trump, but was a bipartisan uh, view on immigration as well. Um, and in a way, I, you know, I think of the American affairs as less about uh, conservatism or the issues of conservatism, though I'll, I'll get to that, but it's really about confronting the failures of the post-Cold War consensus writ large, uh, which, which covers both sides and, and both sides are complicit in. Um, what I would say is most interesting about conservatism in particular is that it never actually developed its own uh, vision of political economy or anything regarding some of the deeper structural issues. Uh, it essentially outsourced all of its economic thought to the libertarians and it outsourced all of its foreign policy thinking, uh, or at least the mainstream uh, eventually outsourced all of its foreign policy thinking to uh, the kind of neoconservatives, which, um, you know, there's multiple generations of them. And the first generation, I think pretty highly of, but by the time you get to the second and third generations, it was a pretty pathetic version of kind of liberal internationalism. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, the, the real problem with conservatism, in my view, uh, which is in a way deeper than the particular policy problems of the 90s and 2000s, is that conservatism has never really had a positive vision for um, political economy or the underlying structure of society at all. It's, I would say, a somewhat loosely connected, frequently changing uh, collection of, you know, um, I'll use a negative term, but cultural grievances uh, that have never really been based on any larger vision for for how to improve the country as a whole or provide a, a guiding vision for the country. Yes, you wrote a piece for the Harvard Kennedy School Review that I actually repurposed as the provocative title uh, for our conversation today, which is, Can Conservatism Be More Than a Grudge? And my observation is that conservatives very much played on the cultural resentments of a particular voting base, uh, such as, you know, evangelical Christians, for example, and yet at the end of the day had no real interest in even addressing the cultural complaints that they were using to gin up votes for themselves. And so you see that even with Trump. Yep. Uh, what happens when Trump is elected? A tax cut. <laughs> it really exactly. has... Uh, it really has very little to do with the, vi the priorities of the voter, which is one of the things that I talked about in my piece that I wrote for you about Indiana. The actual priorities of the Republican voter uh, are pretty much ignored, you know, by the party who feels that they kind of know best and are very obsessed with their issues around libertarian economics or, uh, you know, again, wars. Yeah, I mean, it's really shocking if you look at... Um you know, the, the effort that was made on the tax cut, um, which in retrospect, you know, most people have pretty much admitted didn't really produce the boost in investment and other things that it was supposed to do. But if you compare the effort on that to, say, immigration, where the Trump White House really did nothing and there, there were a few bills proposed and they, they made almost zero effort to uh, carry that across. And before COVID, I think the most meaningful thing they did uh, was actually expand some of the agricultural seasonal worker visas uh, and right. maybe maybe built about, you know, two miles of, of a fake wall. Right. Now, I will give Trump credit for one thing. He did keep us out of wars. Uh, in yeah, the no, I, he, he did not take on his biggest accomplishment, in essence, was not starting another war, which they were clearly gunning for in Syria and or Iran. Yeah, you have to give him credit for that, although yeah, it's kind of a low bar. And I would say, you know, Robert Lighthizer at the USTR on trade, you know, they did, they certainly changed the discussion and they, they've definitely made some positive steps there. 
So that's a very, very long March. Um, and, you know, they, they fell short in a lot of areas, too. Uh, but, you know, the, we can go through the Trump administration point mm -hmm. by point like anything. Right. It's a complicated thing. But certainly I agree with you in the larger sense that, you know, this is a the Republican Party and the so-called conservative movement is really designed to cut taxes and not much else. And it, it's never I'm not sure that it's ever really had a positive vision for what it wants society to be. And it's a fascinating discussion in how, um, you know, so many of these constituencies have, you know, it's, it's been able to command their loyalty without really doing anything uh, or very little to deliver uh, constituent priorities. Yeah, well, the great accomplishment of conservatism as a political project was convincing their voters that they should never expect their elected officials to do anything for them personally. The idea that the government would do anything for the Republican voter was treated as illegitimate, big government expansion. We're all about freedom. Of course, they did lots of tangible things for their donor class uh, yeah. that didn't get a lot of attention. But this whole idea that you create a political philosophy that says, vote for me and I won't do anything for you is really amazing that people bought it and I guess it does play in at some level to this sort of Jacksonian folk libertarianism that really does appeal to a significant percentage of the American population, sort of has a kind of a get off my lawn uh, view of the world when it comes to government. But, but it's shocking that you can deliver so little for your people election after election and they somehow don't start asking questions about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, even even in the Jacksonian libertarian stuff, I mean, you know, a lot of these same voter blocks were essential parts of the New Deal coalition. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm hesitant to ascribe too much essentialism to that. But I think, I mean, you know, what's interesting is not so much uh, complaints against certain bad regulations or something like that. I have plenty of those that I could make myself. Um, what's fascinating is the shift from saying, you know, this particular measure is, you know, having a lot of unintended consequences or it's not working to therefore uh, you should never do anything. And the only way for anything to work is if you never actually have a conscious plan or policy and attempt to do something. That's the shift of, of libertarianism that is so damaging. Uh, and, you know, I, you, you see some of their leading lights say it now that, you know, if, uh, if things don't work, it, it doesn't mean that markets failed. It means that we failed markets. Uh, it's a very bizarre view. And there's a whole kind of sociology trying to explain it. I mean, I, there may be something to it. I mean, in the one sense, it's, it's a perfect way to uh, absolve yourself of any, any leadership responsibility. It's sort of, you know, the market will just magically solve every problem. Uh, and the other part of it, I wonder, is, you know, when you are the unipolar hegemon, uh, there is a kind of you need to sort of justify yourself on on something. Uh, and and it, it's a serviceable ideology. It was both in the British Empire, maybe in the American, the apex of the American Empire as well to sort of say, well, you know, the the market has spoken and this is what it delivered and we should all be very happy about it. Right. One of the things that I think you've done a great job with American affairs in is showing that some of the assumptions that underlie the way conservatives think about the world economically are empirically false. One of them is this notion that corporations are profit maximizing entities, that the goal of the corporation is to maximize profit. You wrote a fascinating article personally for the journal talking about how empirically corporations do not maximize profit. Uh, can, you, can you just give me like a little bit of an explanation of that? I know it's kind of a complicated piece, but I would love to give people a taste of kind of the revisionism, if you want to call it, that you will find in the pages of the magazine. And that's a great one. Yeah, well, uh, two, two prefatory remarks first. Um, one, that, that's not just a kind of conservative error. Again, I think that that has been the the idea of profit maximization being the basis of, you know, commerce and economics is, you know, the bedrock of the whole economics profession. Uh, and it's not just conservatives who, 
fell for that one or were misled by that one, uh, even if they have probably, you know, taken it, taken it furthest. Um, and second, of course, like corporation, it's not that they don't seek to maximize profit per se, but those activities are cabined within very specific um, uh, categories, uh, which are defined by essentially what, what uh, activities or uh, streams of cash flows will get the highest valuation uh, in financial markets. Um, and where, where things went off the rails is, you know, much of the theory behind neoliberalism, if, you know, to use a shorthand, is they basically assume that if you, if you subject the economy to more financial market control and financial market influence, that this would discipline companies and cause them to maximize profits more and you would get all of the good things that capitalism has always promised, growth, productivity, and so on. Um, but in fact, it, financial markets introduce their own incentives. And so firms, firm behavior is really driven to maximize their value in financial markets. Now that can involve increasing profits, but often it's much easier to do things like share buybacks or certain kinds of spinoffs to position your company in a certain asset class and so on that will get you a higher valuation, but don't actually involve making the investments doing the innovation, growing the company in the way that classical capitalism imagines. So you don't actually get the productivity gains and larger social outcomes that uh, the whole theory is predicated upon. Uh, you actually just get really high stock market valuations uh, and a very stagnant economy. And in the case of the United States, uh, you know, uh, declining and uh, eviscerated industrial base. Yeah, we've seen that. Record stock market values, low productivity growth, stagnant real wages. The economy in aggregate hasn't actually been growing all that fast since about 2000. And, you know, I mean, the, res the results were not as advertised. I think the same thing was true with trade. And all of what we were told was going to happen when we had free trade. And the economist just kept denying and denying that there was any problem for free trade up until probably around 2016, I think it was, when the famous China shock study yeah. came out. That was really the first time that any economist, you know, call it reputable economist that I'm aware of, admitted that trade with China actually did cost us a lot of jobs. Yeah, well, the whole thing is a fascinating history. I mean, uh, Paul Krugman essentially won his Nobel Prize by uh, discrediting the simplistic theories of, of free trade, uh, but nevertheless was a extremely staunch advocate for free trade uh, for decades, basically under the assumption that governments could never do anything right. And so, you know, even if the theory of free trade doesn't work, you should you should still go for it. Uh, and, and, you know, when he recanted that, it was a couple of years ago and uh, he wrote an essay for a book. I forget the titles, but his, then what he said was, OK, that was wrong, but now it's too late to do anything about it. <laughs> yes, you know, we, the downside of being a guy like Krugman, who's been around a long time writing a lot of columns is there's always a column you can find, like his famous one about the right minimum wage, zero dollars and zero cents. I don't know if you remember. that. I don't one. even remember that. He, one. Wrote, he wrote he wrote that that column. But but, but on I, the subject, there's actually some really good uh, Larry Summers papers from the mid to late 1980s uh, that are that are sharply critical of the financial services industry. Uh, and and I think one of them is titled like when financial markets work too well <laughs> uh, and they're quite good. And it's really interesting. You, you know, we would never think of uh, later career Larry Summers uh, taking that line. Um, but actually, that was probably some of his best work. Yes, I see the same thing with conservative economic theory at the state level, which was the uh, subject of my piece that I wrote for you in the November issue around Indiana under Republican rule. This idea that Republicans have, say, look at Texas, they don't have an income tax, they have all this light regulation, everybody's moving there from California, look at the high taxes in California, New Jersey, New York, just cut taxes, cut regulation, and the marketplace will do its magic. And here in Indiana, Mitch Daniels was elected governor uh, in 2004, took office 2005. And unlike a lot of people, he was actually competent to do things. So he actually went out and did this. <laughs> and in fact, the Republicans in Indiana basically implemented all of the formulas. They cut taxes, they cut regulations. 
Uh, and the theory that he came up with was, we need to build the best sandbox for businesses to play in, create this great sandbox and the free market, the businesses will come in and it'll be magic. And it didn't happen. You know, we became poorer relative to the nation. Uh, since then, our job and population growth have been weak. It just didn't work. It's like we did it. It didn't work. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Kansas is another example yeah. of that. Um, though that, you know, of course, uh, Texas is successful uh, and we and we should attempt to learn from them. It, it's an issue I've thought about a lot. And it, it kind of goes to one of the weaknesses, not only of, of conservative economists or, or uh, politicians, but uh, ec ec the ma mainstream economics in general and, and financial markets as well is that people don't actually think about industries. Um, and when you look at when California was, you know, the most successful state, which it was for a number of decades, you know, they really had five industries. Um, they had agriculture, which they always had. They had oil. Uh, they had uh, tech at, you know, in the early years, it was kind of clustered around defense and stuff in, um, uh, you know, the early Silicon Valley. Uh, they had, of course, professional services and finance. Uh, and, and they also, you know, there was a lot of military stuff there. Um, and you look at Texas today, uh, they actually have all five of those. They've got oil, they've got agriculture, they have tech in Austin, they have, you know, professional services, um, and they have, there's a huge defense presence as well. Uh, and you, ha you know, I, I think conservatives in particular don't think enough about attracting or what, what kind of industries do they want to attract and what are the right kind of industries that actually have larger spillover effects and, and build up um, productivity and, and the lar have larger economic effects, which usually involves manufacturing. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think, you know, it's, it's been a huge failure, not just to conservatism, um, but, but uh, the, you know, economic thinkers in general to ignore the differences between industries. And I also find it interesting when you think about, you know, you hear a lot of complaints now, um, maybe not complaints, but kind of an online commentary that, oh, we've got all these blue state people moving to Texas and Florida. They're just going to turn our states blue. Uh, and it's interesting question, because I think if all that happens is you get a bunch of hedge funds and tech companies that move to Texas or Florida uh, for lower tax rates, they probably will turn those states blue because, you know, not to reduce everything to economic incentives, but, you know, these sort of economic activities do carry with them certain certain underlying beliefs and attitudes and uh, desires for how an economy and society are structured. Uh, so if you're not actually attracting a different kind of industry that would support a more conservative, for lack of a better word, vision of society, that may very well end up being the case. Yeah, I, I could certainly believe that. Academic growth seems to be more mysterious than people would like it to think. There's a university a law professor at University of Virginia. I think his name is Richard Schrager. He wrote a book uh, on city power. He's an expert on uh, laws governing the powers that municipalities have. And his argument, I was on a panel with him and it was great. He says, we don't know what causes economic developments. But his theory was, in that case, local government should just do what they want. That put the economic regulations in place that you want to have for the kind of community you want to build. And it won't necessarily harm your economy won't necessarily help your economy, but whether or not you have economic growth is not tied to things like local economic regulations uh, of the kinds you have. And I thought it was an interesting theory uh, with that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the correlation seems much, much less strong than people often think. I mean, after all, um, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of uh, arguments about, well, we'll, we'll have such a so much better venture capital like it'll be much better uh, environment for venture capital if you just cut capital gains rates but of course you know silicon valley occurred in the highest tax rate state in the country um so yeah i mean the one thing i would say i think certainly at a local level um you know it, it's very difficult at at a national level i think there are actually a number of pretty solid case studies which one can't simply copy and paste but which the U.S. has done a particularly poor job of learning from. Uh, in particular, you know, I would I would point to the Asian development models, um, whether that's Korea or Japan or China, uh, and increasingly others. Uh, I think Israel um, 
had a very uh, intelligent policy when it came to building up their uh, high tech manufacturing space. So I think there, you know, there are actual. It, it, it's very hard to think about this when you're simply talking in, in the broad concept of economic growth. But if you're thinking about building sort of underlying industries and capabilities, that you can do. And there may not be. There's no guarantee that the larger growth will come with it. Uh, but I think there are some fairly sensible blueprints that one could pursue if one wants to say build a manufacturing industry. Yeah. The other thing that is important in this gets back to this idea of the cultural priorities and turning Texas blue. Yeah. I think about this a lot. The real legacy of Rudolph Giuliani in New York was the complete extermination of the Republican Party and conservative thought as a political force in New York City, which it was prior to his reforms. And how do you create an environment that is both good for your people and does not bring about the conditions in which your cultural milieu is liquidated? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, what happened there was, you know, uh, he was successful in, in, in dealing with crime and, and some of the other major problems. Um, but I don't think there was ever much of a vision for sort of bringing in middle-class jobs for, for, for supporting families living in the city. Uh, and so the and net result was uh, Michael Bloomberg's luxury city, uh, which whatever its merits is, is not very conducive toward the sort of uh, family values culture uh, or whatever you wanna call it that conservatives at least should be for. Um, but, uh, you know, the other interesting question in all this is, you know, why are there no uh, Republican urban machines uh, there? You know, we've had these Democrat cities that have been one party uh, municipalities for decades, you know, three times as long as I've been alive, at least. Uh, and there used to be Republican machines. I forget. Philadelphia which one. Philadelphia was a Philadelphia. Republican. Yeah. But there aren't any. Uh, and I think that's a fascinating question that, you know, even from a very narrow instrumental political operative perspective, uh, conservatives should be thinking about, but it never seems to come up. Yes, well, here in Indianapolis, we had not a political machine in the traditional sense of the word, like Daly was running a political machine, but this was a city that was completely Republican dominated for probably you know three or four decades. And today, it, it and, the key is they actually governed pretty well. And this was a city that was, you know, well regarded uh, for the things that it did economically in, in terms of good governance. Uh, you may know Steve Goldsmith, uh, who's also been up at Harvard, became, a, still is a national thinker uh, in terms of uh, operations, excellence and governance. I mean, he was the mayor of Indianapolis, then became deputy mayor of New York. And yet the Republican Party's basically been liquidated in, in Indianapolis hmm. as well. And all I think the interesting thing about those people is they were all essentially from the liberal Republican tradition or the moderate Republican tradition. Yep. And the ones that are still left here, there are some older 60s, 70s type Republican stalwarts who've become essentially like never Trumpers. All they do is write screeds talking about how horrible the conservative people of the state are. But I do think there is something about the loss of the liberal Republican tradition that's that's uh, kind of damaging for our country in some respects. Whatever the problems of it were, it had some uh, some good leavening effects, I think. Well, I think it's still harkened back to when the party had something of a vision, um, you know, which I think you really probably have to go back to like Theodore Roosevelt um, or something like that. The, the pre-New Deal Republicans, where it, it wasn't just a purely negative orientation toward the state. Uh, they had a sense of what they wanted to do. Yeah. You mentioned that these hedge funds and these tech companies coming to Texas might bring with them certain values and orientations that could potentially turn these states blue. One of the things I found interesting in your Harvard Kennedy review piece, Harvard Kennedy School review piece, was around the link between corporate America and kind of conservatism in the Republican Party. You argue that in essence, all of the rising industries are structurally aligned with the left and therefore 
you know, conservatism has been left devoid of a material base of any substance. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, it certainly feels that way to me. Um, and maybe starting starting from starting from the end and working backwards. I mean, you see that with essentially how cheaply um, the mainstream conservative think tanks are bought off. Uh, I mean, big tech will come in and give them a pittance and they'll go out and, and shill for everything big tech wants um, without, without ever really uh, demanding anything, uh, even in terms of their own kind of electoral uh, viability. Um, or the same thing with like the health insurance industry, uh, you know, and, and there it's even more stark because whenever anybody talks about, say, um, having the federal government negotiate prices for Medicare with big pharma, which is what every other country in the world does, you know, AEI and heritage will, will go all go nuts about socialized medicine or whatever. And, and pharma will give them money to, to do that. Uh, but if, you know, somebody talks about repealing or, you know, when it comes to say repealing Obamacare, which nobody in pharma wants, you know, um, the, the conservative movement then is, you know, the, they take the money in one hand, but there's no price to be paid. They, they just they sell out for nothing and they sell out their, uh, you know, their constituents, the people they represent essentially for nothing. Um, and so working back, I mean, I think that's just evidence of the fact that the contemporary Republican Party or conservative movement essentially has no alternative positive vision for the future of the country or what they would like to do. And, you know, it's a, it's maybe a chicken and the egg thing, but I think ultimately for such a vision to to really um, manifest uh, or, or become coherent, uh, you would need some actual constituency, uh, material constituency, some donor set of donors, corporate lobby, stuff like that, that actually wants a different vision of political economy. Now, in the piece, I outlined, you know, one thought of what this could be, which is basically, you know, a lot of corporate America that's on the wrong side of big tech. Um, some of some of the groups that would benefit from industrial policy essentially competing against Chinese and other industrial policy. And, uh, you know, there would be some financial interests that would benefit from that alignment. Um, but, you know, the fact is that's, you know, not really on the horizon. And there's very little effort um, within within conservative circles to really try to build such a thing. Uh, much, much happier to sort of uh, opportunistically uh, take what they can from the existing dominant industries and and fight for their interests half the time and and then simply not not really do anything uh, the rest of the time. Yes, even the oil industry seems to have made its peace with the left. And you know you would think that would be an industry if it were really going to be a staunch Republican industry. And maybe they are, but they seem remarkably timid. Uh, if so, and that was where conservatism was financed for many years. It was independent oil money. Um, well, there's also, I mean, that's, I mean, it's an interesting one because there's, there's big divides in the oil industry. I mean, you have your kind of smaller um, pure play exploration companies, uh, you know, be like pioneer resources or something like that. And they're pretty, pretty strongly Republican. Um, but your larger, you know, the integrated oil companies, the Exxons and whatever, um, they, you know, they're much more political animals, um, and I think would be happy to make their peace with the left and, and could live with whatever, whatever kind of new regime comes out. Uh, and I think, you know, even, even going more deeply than that, I mean, you had a massive financialization of commodity sectors in general and the oil industry in particular, it's not, it's not the oil industry that it was in the 1970s or whatever where it was, you know, um, basically companies operating as companies, not as sort of financial speculation opportunities. Uh, and, and once you've introduced kind of financial control, not only over commodity prices, but increasingly over the operations of the company, I think you're likely to get a different um, political orientation uh, in general that, that again, um, will be happy to oppose any regulations that narrowly affect the bottom line, but don't necessarily um, want a different vision for say building up communities or something like that. There's been a revival in essentially Hamiltonianist thinking uh, on the economy that we need to go back to uh, 
the American system uh, or, you know, the, the internal improvements, the tariffs, the thing that uh, has been someone called the American system America's most successful export ever, that essentially that is what Japan, Korea, China, they just copied the playbook that we ran when we were the rising power in the 19th century. Uh, Michael Lind has sort of argued uh, some of this, I think, for a while, maybe not in exactly those terms. Do you think that's a realistic approach uh, for an economy that is not a rising economy, but is essentially a mature economy? Uh, for example, infrastructure investment in a place where we already have a lot of infrastructure doesn't seem to make as much sense. And the returns on infrastructure investment, like highway investment, has been in decline since the 70s significantly. How should we be thinking about the right economic policy for the country today? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think certainly like the general principles of the American system, which is having a strong uh, domestic industrial base, supporting innovation in your own country, all those principles are you know, perhaps timeless or as close to timeless as you can get for an economic principle. But they have to be applied appropriately uh, to the circumstances. And, you know, I think, you know, you could Germany, Japan, China, all of them sort of uh, copy this model in broad terms, but they also did so in, in appropriate ways for their circumstances. Uh, and I think, you know, we could certainly learn a lot from them. But in the U.S. case, uh, going back to our previous discussion, what we have to deal with is the fact that, uh, again, companies driven by financial market metrics um, are not going to respond to the, the tools in the way that you expect them to. Uh, so if you, you know, in simple terms, if you just cut taxes, for example, they're probably not going to invest more in their operations. They're probably just going to do more share buybacks. If you just cut interest rates, they might borrow more, but they're not actually going to borrow more to build up their operations. They'll do it in order to increase their stock market valuation. Even when it comes to things like direct subsidies, it's probably not going to work in the same way um, that you think it will or that conventional economic theory will predict uh, because, uh, again, the companies, are, they don't have any real payoff in terms of uh, the way their executives are compensated or what their shareholders want to do that. So you, you even saw that actually in the Trump administration. There was a bit of an effort to get um, Cisco to buy Ericsson in order to compete with Huawei on 5G. And basically, Cisco said, we don't we don't want anything to do with that because that manufacturing business, it has lower margins and therefore it'll depress our stock market multiple. We don't want it. There's no amount of money you could give us to get to make that work. So with all that being said, and obviously there's a lot of other complexity, too, but at the very least, if, if we want to return to growth uh, in simple terms, we have to deal with that issue. I think in practice, what that would mean is, is sort of dealing with the financial industry as it is and probably de-risking some of these uh, manufacturing or other more capital intensive industries such that even though you don't get the returns uh, that are competitive with software or other intellectual property, you would at least uh, by de-risking them, make them more attractive to financial investors today. Anyway, that's just one example mm -hmm. of how you, you have to deal with the circumstances uh, that exist. And certainly simply just, oh, let's just copy what Japan did in 1960 or what China did in 2000. Uh, no, of course, that's you, you can't do that. Today, there's a lot of talk in the press about the so-called new right. Uh, of all these groups who are embracing different forms of, you know, protectionism or post-liberal politics, or whatever you want to call it. You can think of the national conservatism crowd. Uh, you could think of American Compass. You could think of, um, you know, maybe First Things Magazine. Maybe people would put American Affairs in there. You participate in some of them. I like to say there's nothing older than the new right. Every so often, uh, some group comes along of insurgent, would-be reformists. So much of the rhetoric is exactly the same. You know, going back to the 70s, the new right of the 70s, uh, they talked about how they didn't want to conserve anything. We want to have a revolution. And I'm like, wow, I've heard that before. <laughs> uh, what really uh, I find particularly fascinating and disturbing in many ways is how almost identical 
the early 90s populist literature is to what's being written today. Uh, I might actually write a piece about this. Who knows? Maybe I'll pitch something to you at some point. But if you go back and read Kevin Phillips, mm -hmm. Politics of Rich and Poor or Boiling Point, uh, if you read uh, Michael Lenz, Next American Nation, uh, if you read uh, that uh, essays on immigration, like The Politics of National Suicide or Alien Nation, which was a mainstream book uh, when it came <laughs> out. I mean, Peter Bremelow started yep. his media tour on the Today Show with Bryant Gumbel. Uh, you could read Arthur Schlesinger's yeah. Disuniting yeah. of America. Mm -hmm. And if you just replace Afrocentric curriculum with CRT, the book would be publishable today, like word for word. Albeit by a different publisher. <laughs> by, yes, by a different publisher. But it is so interesting that, uh, and then Pat Buchanan was essentially a proto Trump. And yet all of that came along. And this material is much more compelling. Kevin Phillips analysis of the Reagan administration is far more compelling than any analysis I've read today of our economics. Uh, I think a lot of the thinkers back then were in many ways superior to what they are today. Uh, you know, love him or hate him, Sam Francis had profound insights uh, into things that, you know, you're not seeing today, which are more derivatives of Sam Francis. And yet the results of that were essentially zilch. It fizzled out around 1996. And the, the end result was simply a doubling down. We passed NAFTA. We passed the Uruguay round of trade talks. We admitted China to the WTO. It was full steam ahead. If anything, the result of that was an acceleration of neoliberalization and other trends that were out there. Is anything going to be different this time, realistically? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure you want me to answer that, honestly. <laughs> um, I mean, two thoughts. The first is that... Uh, it's, you know, none of that ever had a, a, a material constituency. Um, and, you know, in America, if you don't have somebody lobbying for you, you're not going to pass any legislation. That's how it works. And all of this stuff was intellectually very compelling, uh, but it really did not have a serious lobby behind it. And we can get into the reasons why or why that didn't happen. Um, but it's simply the case that there wasn't a real lobby then. And frankly, there isn't one now. Um, and so I think in that, in, you know, as long as that is the case, it's going to be very hard, uh, to win significant victories. Although when, you know, you get say the semiconductor industry association behind you, uh, then you can get things like the chips act once in a while, though that one hasn't totally crossed the finish line, but you know, it did clear the Senate. The second thing on the new right discourse, which I have find, found most fascinating about this version of it, um, and maybe it, it was you know, true to some degree then too, actually, but the focus has been on the culture war side of it, which many of the new right movements are arguably, uh, you know, more radical, so to speak, when it comes to their cultural policy preferences, but they are arguably more mainstream, actually much closer to the left or the democratic party in some ways, when you talk about political economy and economic policy. But that story is never really discussed. I mean, it's a, it's there. People are sort of aware of it. But the big policy or the big articles are never really about that. Um, and we actually have an upcoming an article in the next issue about how the culture war in America, um, you know, I'll steal it. It's by Michael Cuenco, um, uh, who's you know now an associate editor of American Affairs. But uh, I'll steal the, one of the lines, which was, you know, if um, Mark said religion was the opiate of the masses, um, the culture wars are, are the bath salts of the bourgeoisie, uh, mm -hmm. this phrase, which is, it gets everybody so excited about these symbolic issues uh, that there's, there's just not enough energy left over to focus on actually where there is a larger convergence. And, you know, the sad thing about the new right discourse is that it's essentially all there to hide the fact that there is a lot more convergence now on political economy issues within kind of the intellectual world within smarter people in the policy world and so on um but you know the treatment of the new right makes it all about kind of uh increasing de debates increasing intensity over culture war issues uh and essentially is likely to preclude maybe the formation of of a larger block which uh you know historically if you look at like the new deal coalition 
you had intense disparity between Northeastern liberals and Southern, essentially kind of state capitalist, uh, Southern conservative Democrats. But they managed to, you know, put that aside and form a coalition around economic policy that that worked at least for a few decades. But something like that just seems impossible now. And uh, I think that to me is the most frustrating part about the current dialogue on the new right. And I think as long as it's just discussed as the new right, it probably probably doesn't have, you know, doesn't look too promising. Yes, I do think we've seen some changes in the political economy. Uh, maybe another consequence of Trump has been a change on China. I don't think we're going back to the pre-Trump view of China. It seems to me that the establishment of America, oh, that's kind of a bad term to use, but the elite bipartisan consensus now agrees China's a problem. And that we need to do something about China. Maybe not what, but this idea that like, oh, well, more free trade with China is always good. Maybe it's because the corporations are all getting squeezed out there now and there's no more money to be made in China. They've made all the money they can make in China and uh, now there's no more profit uh, in the China trade. Uh, but it does seem there. Uh, on the culture war side, I mean, uh, I would say it's not merely symbolic. Immigration is not a symbolic point. Uh, immigration is fundamentally transformative of the country. So to the yeah, I don't, I don't that, think, yeah. I mean, well, but immigration is one of those issues where it has a cultural component and it has an economic component. Um, now, you know, frankly, both of them are pretty polarized, but mm -hmm. I think if, if you talk about immigration in economic terms, it is at least somewhat possible to have a kind of calm debate, reason discourse, so to speak. Once you get into the cultural side of it, everybody's calling each other a racist or something, uh, and there's there's no capacity for any sort of progress at all, is my experience with the issue. Hmm. And and the fact that when we talk about immigration, we talk about it as a culture war issue, suggests that it's going to be very difficult to make any substantial progress on it. Well, I've always said if these trends with Hispanic voting continues, and it looks like the Hispanics will become a Republican constituency at some point, the Democrats will build a wall so fast it's going to make your head spin. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's true. Well, and it's also a problem for any any kind of larger and more positive realignment that both parties are in a sort of race to the bottom. Uh, and so, you know, um, if if you're an average Republican politician, you don't you don't have to do anything. Uh, and and after you know, once you have a Republican in president for two years, the Democrats don't have to do much either um, because the the disaffection dissatisfaction will continue and the the people just keep throwing the bums out mm -hmm. back and forth. I mean, it's somewhat weird. You're you're probably more a historian than I am, but to have gone as long as we have without kind of a dominant party and ideology sort of consolidating and and shifting the government direction you know it it feels uh, unusual to me in in american history i mean you tend to you know you went from the post civil war republicans uh to the new deal to reagan you know and we've really been i would say since late bush through obama through trump uh in you know where you know one party is taking the house every couple of years back and forth well, i think we're due uh, for that but we have to have something that works. I mean, one reason that those other things happened is they fundamentally worked or they were settled through military conquest or you know, defeat in the case of the Civil War. I think one reason is that the goods have not been delivered. Um, you know, after World War II coming into the post-war era, that sort of solidified ultimately the New Deal because things did well. Uh, but the original conservatives were about trying to roll back the New Deal. They were still idea yeah. they were going to roll it back, and then events sort of overtook them, uh, if you will. My last question is, what is your prognostication for the future of conservatism and or the Republican Party? Actually, before I get to that, I want to get back to China because I didn't, okay. I didn't get to comment on that. But I, I feel on the one hand, there has been a larger consensus around, you know, we can't just pretend that China is going to become democratic anymore. The policy of the 90s didn't work. We have to take a firmer line. Uh, we're getting outcompeted. But it, feel, it still feels to me that for the most part, this has resulted in a lot of kind of moralistic liberal rhetoric uh, and not a lot of real efforts to build up American uh, productive or state capacity. Um, you know, I and, agree with that. 
I think that's the first step. I mean, when you look at the reporting on the Olympics, the 2022 yeah. Winter Olympics versus the reporting on the 20, is it 2016? 2008, Beijing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whenever they had Beijing, we're, they're getting like the Sochi treatment. They really and, are. Yeah. Uh, right now. And that's entirely a product of the U.S. media deciding to portray them badly. And I think that says something about how our, uh, how our uh, system views them now. I, don't, yeah. I agree that we haven't gotten anywhere on it yet necessarily, but people are now waking up to that. Well, that would be the optimistic view. Um, at the same time, our, our trade deficit is larger than ever, and we've uh, done a lot of deals to allow greater financial integration so you know BlackRock can make more money in China. Um, but anyway, uh, in terms of, the, you know, I don't think that conservative, I think conservatism has been done for a while, at least in the sense of, the 1950s, 60s fusionism, the Reagan three-legged stool. I mean, is there anyone who really believes in all three legs of the stool anymore or that they go together? I, I'm not sure. Um, and the, you know, the question is, again, as I said in the, in the conservatism as a grudge article, you know, is there any other collection of interests that could actually unite behind a positive agenda for the Republican Party. There's certainly plenty of ideas out there. Um, obviously, there needs to be more. Uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to do uh, with American affairs and so on. Um, but there, there's a lot of ideas out there now. Um, but there really aren't a lot of real constituencies that are capable of moving the needle in American politics. And so, frankly, I, I don't know whether that's going to come together or not. I feel like that's that's the question and that's the kind of struggle we're in right now um you know for the future of the country i, I hope it does uh but you know it's it's we're a long way from happen from it happening yet well thank you very much for that uh, again i i'm very uncertain how it's going to play out myself but everyone again julius krein is the editor of american affairs journal it's a great policy journal you can find it online at americanaffairsjournal.org I highly uh, subscribe, uh, recommend that you subscribe to it if you're at all interested in policy wonk ideas. This is not light uh, feature reading. It's serious, in-depth proposals uh, that are really about how we move our country forward uh, from where we are today. So, Julius, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, it was my pleasure, and I look forward to the, um, the article you have pitched me 